Leila Haji. Leila, Leila, she's the Executive Director of Cultural Heritage Without Borders, Albania, uh, which is an independent, non-governmental uh, organization dedicated to preserving tangible and intangible cultural heritage. Uh, she was trained as a conservation architect, studied and conducted research at the University of Sarajevo, the Academia Astropolitana Nova in Slovakia, and the University of Lund in Sweden. Uh, her field experience in conservation and management aspects of cultural heritage ranges from post-war reconstruction and engagement in peace building processes to conservation development projects in transitional societies. And a few words about cultural heritage without borders Albania. It's a recognized uh, uh, internationally and locally for their work and some of their awards include Certificate of Excellence for European Heritage Stories from the Council of Europe, Man of the Year Award for the City of Berat, Grand Award for Special Contribution by Serbian Association of Conservat Conservators and the European Union Prize for Cultural Heritage by Europa Nostra Award. And so without further ado, Leila, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm just going to yeah, share the share the screen. So I hope you can see the presentation. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, I I need to say how impressed and uh, inspired I am from this morning's presentations and different views and different encounters uh, and how we how we um, how we are conversational and how we are professional and how we engage a wide arrays of communities around us into what we do and also uh, where we create together those narratives is something that. Uh, will definitely will remain with me for some time now. And I must say as well, in these uh, uncertain times, uh, listening to you all has been truly a treat, as I think that's what uh, I have been missing this whole year. Uh, and I uh, really find this morning extraordinarily rewarding. So thank you to all the speakers. And I also particularly would like to thank the organizer for, the, uh, for putting this together and for as well inviting such an interesting and inspiring speakers. So yes, my name is Leila and I'm going to be presenting the work of Cultural Heritage Without Borders and uh, as well be highlighting some of the examples of our approach on engaging with communities around us and around the project sites where we are engaging. So Cultural Heritage Without Borders is a non-governmental organization that has been working in Western Balkans for last 25 years and uh, we are working with preservation of cultural heritage in its broadest sense and as you can imagine working for 25 years in balkans uh, does affect your way of working and as well uh, challenges you and uh, as well makes you shift and change adjust uh, and that's what we have been experiencing for this time of work we have spent in the balkans but what I think that uh, is something that uh, has become extraordinarily clear in the boundaries, kind of in defining the boundaries of our work and as well uh, in defining uh, what we do is what we are actually providing uh, a ground and providing a platform uh, of every project that we do, be it a conservation, be it a management plan, be it a interpretation plan, for us, that's an opportunity to engage uh, with young professionals, with children, with community members, with craft people, and actually allow to all of us and kind of provide to all of us an opportunity to learn together, to engage, to thrive, and as well to empower each other through this process. And I think that's very much the backbone of our work. And I'm going to be explaining just a couple of examples of our work. Uh, and by doing that, uh, first, I would like to say that uh, the work is, just a second, it's pretty much kind of divided into eight key areas. And throughout those key areas, uh, they are very kind of professional in terms of their naming. Uh, but that's just the title because that everything that goes uh, in the background and everything that goes under the surface 
is what actually brings the results within each of these areas of work. So let me start with the practical conservation. So that's the pillar of our work. So we are a professional organization and majority of us are architects and we engage uh, quite largely with uh, conservation of heritage assets, built assets. But the way we engage is that we are actually working with directly with the owners and uh, uh, discussing and defining with them uh, both the, the conservation approach and the methods, uh, but as well with their permission, then we are using their sites to invite professionals and craftspersons who are then learning uh, throughout the processes of physical conservation and, uh, and physical material. And uh, for the time being, we are quite heavily engaged in the foster take recovery uh, process. As maybe some of you know, Albania was hit by a very strong earthquake last year, and that had brought down quite a few of the cultural heritage assets. And one of them you are looking at in your screen, it's the Tower C. It's the fifth century tower in the Hercules and it has partially collapsed. And for us, the key now to this conservation and to this reconstruction is uh, to actually engage as much as possible, both with young professionals and senior professionals, but also with community leaders. As uh, through the different phases of work that we have been encountering until now, we have had many pastors by trying to tell us how they feel about this and what needs to be done with this particular asset. And that's what I think is something none of us should forget, uh, that we go through the trauma of heritage loss together. And it affects us in ways that we cannot really even uh, begin to understand. And therefore, the reconstruction and the aspect of rebuilding this needs to be done together. Because uh, the process of uh, healing is something that definitely cultural heritage can provide for. And uh, another area where we uh, engage are the areas of the management plans and management planning. And this is uh, one of the areas that we are really keen to, uh, to work as much as possible because we have understood that besides the physical conservation, uh, what is extremely important is of course the envisaging for the sustainable future of those sites and particularly of the sites which are conserved. And one of the examples of those management plans we are looking at the screen is the management plan for the Trim Archaeological Park, which is a World Heritage Site. And this was a very important project because this was the first plan that was actually approved for this site. But what it meant for us that besides the assets being conserved, we as well got an opportunity to discuss with the local fishermen or with the local uh, uh, orange producer or with the local artisans who all have their set of issues and they all have their set of dreams and bringing and threading in those dreams into an official document is something I think that is quite challenging. Uh, and I think that what we have faced as a challenge is how are we going to see to it so that those dreams are actually realized and not only left in a kind of, in, in a way or in the form of the kind of official formulation. In the pipeline now, we are working, or we are having uh, to work with the management plan of one of the quite notorious sites in central Albania, which is the labor, former labor camp in the communist period. And this is a very, very poor uh, uh, part of Albania. It's in the zone of Mirgita. But this site, in a way, can become a beacon of local development and local engagement, and as well, local employment, which uh, we think would be extremely, extremely important. But another plan that we are as well looking at are the plans for the historical houses in Jokasta. Because in both cases of Svach, the labor camp, and the historical uh, houses in Jokasta, what is very important for us is that management as a tool is usually seen as an official document run and governed by the central authority level. However, what we are trying to bring forward is to connect with local authorities and connect with the local community members so that they become owners of those management plans and those, uh, those aspirations for future. And in this way, we believe, that, well, we believe actually that this is the only way in which we can kind of raise the sense of responsibility and also raise the sense of aspiration, or not aspiration, but appreciation, which is extremely important and which is something that we need to really do. 
uh, further aspects in which we are working with are as well uh, disaster risk response as a part of the spatial planning procedures. And this is a very, very uh, important aspect of work because by uh, continuously mapping and continuously understanding the conditions of cultural heritage assets, we can then uh, work about best strategies for their conservation. But as well, this gives us an opportunity to understand the local problems and as well individual problems of the individual monument owners. And this is one case as such, and one of these kind of individual problems. Uh, you're looking into the images of the historical cistern in uh, Giropastra residential dwelling. Uh, Giropastra is a city in the south of Albania, and it's a World Heritage Site, and their owners uh, or monuments are quite dense, and owners are facing a lot of problems because of uh, the threat to uh, the risk for the assets when it comes to fire uh, or when it comes to uh, earthquake or uh, when it comes to kind of lack of uh, means to actually maintain their assets are just few of the risks they are facing. And uh, what was extremely important for us is that together, working together with them, I'm oh, sorry, it jumped. Uh, Working together with them, actually, we are hoping to, uh, we have been hoping to uh, counteract those, up, yeah, to counteract some of those risks. And this is the example where, for example, together with the owners, we have been working on assistance on how these historical you know, cisterns, uh, which are collecting rainwater, can become a very viable source of water when it comes to fire. But not only uh, to turn a cistern into a viable so source of water when it comes to a fire for one house, but how one house can then uh, actually serve the whole neighborhood. And in this respect, then we are also trying to work with owners and different monument owners so that they're sharing and then their neighboring sharing is beyond coffee drinking. So in that respect, this is something that we have uh, found challenging, but also really interesting and rewarding as an experience. Uh, further aspects of our work are in, including a lot of um, training and uh, and a lot of vocation tra vocation training and as well um, community and children engagement. Uh, as I said, that's the backbone of our work. But this particular segment of program is dealing directly and only with that. And as I said, the conservation projects are an ideal opportunity for learning because only by touching the material, by smelling it, by by being uh, by by facing those challenges of food to physical deterioration or a lack of usage, that's the only moment that we actually can can be in front of something and be challenged by it physically and mentally. And we use this ongoing conservation project to engage as many craftspersons and young professionals as possible. So that, as a result, have had uh, two large programs. Uh, that have been now running for quite a few years. One is the program for young professionals, which is called the Regional Rest Restoration Camp, where we have been training around 1,100 young professionals in four countries of the Western Balkans. And those 1,100 were coming from 25 different nationalities. And uh, on the other hand, the second large program is the program with the training of the craftspersons. Because what we have as well understood is that uh, the craftspersons are not recognized as a category of the professional, especially in Albania. But by uh, passing the certification programs, which are five months long, now we have we are really proud to uh, certify 270 of them. And what is even more important for us is the fact that now companies, in order to continue with conservation and have and acquire their conservation rights, they have to employ them. And that's the only kind of way we feel that this particular category that we all depend on when it comes to quality conservation can actually be fully integrated and this program can as well empower them and as well allow them to have the life they are actually deserving. And another program that I would like to mention is the image on the left hand of the right hand side is that every project we do uh, from physical conservations to management, we try to convert them into, uh, into educational toolkit for children. And you're looking into a board game, which is printed on, a, on like six by six on the floor. We are by guiding the kind of, you know, stepping through the, let's say a city's heritage, children play, but also learn about specific aspects of cultural heritage. And we are looking into the board game, which was done for Shkodra, which is one of the historical cities in North of Albania. Another, uh, another aspect of our work includes an interpretation. Uh, we as architects, we are sometimes extremely narrow-minded, 
and as well we only can see you know what's the what the what's the dimension of a, of a plan or what's the kind of what the detail of the window on the facade but then we in time we understood that that's maybe not the essential information that everybody needs to know about and how you actually get those stories out and how you actually share those stories is of course by engaging with within that interpretation processes and it's, this is one of the examples where we have been trying to tie both the community stories and legends with the biodiversity of the sites uh, then with the interesting uh, interesting kind of anecdotes which are linked to the site and all this was done for the past of Jirokasta. Then uh, one more particular, particularly important part of our work is something we call the site development, but it's not a classical site development. Uh, because as I said, kind of while working with assets and while working with kind of tangible, tangible and cultural heritage sites, it's extremely important to, uh, to engage with and understand who actually lives behind that door. But not only who lives behind that door, uh, uh, because what we have realized is, is that everyone pretty much everyone who lives behind the door of the historical house, he, she always wants to get engaged in the processes of preservation and processes of tourism, et etc. Et but where, where we were making a mistake before is that the pro, the pro, our, our approach was kind of tailored just more like one size fits all. And this is, uh, I think, the mistake that many are doing. But what we have realized is that we have to go a little bit deeper and we need to understand each individual skill set of each of the local mon monument owners in order to see the ways on how to engage them in both processes of preservation but also processes of tourism because for example many of the monument owners they want to open their door to the to tourists but maybe not all of them want to have it as a hotel maybe not uh, everyone wants to cook maybe not everyone has a skill to offer so the idea here is to kind of you know go and take out this where they feel comfortable in this process and where they feel comfortable in giving the service of their house or in what kind of service their house can be used. And this is where we are trying to work a lot with the social mapping in terms of skills and understanding kind of what owners can do for their own assets and for the assets of the kind of whole city in order to kind of provide or provide for more of a layered, uh, layered visitation and also uh, interest for tourists and for the uh, local economies. Another uh, interesting part of our work is that where we find, we find it interesting is that um, so beside this encounter with the community and how we kind of work together in order to preserve assets and also utilize those assets for the best uh, for the best of their uh, for the best of their being, uh, there is also this other side and that is that uh, there are as well community members and as well different groups of professionals and individuals who uh, have in one moment in their life been put, that they were privileged and they were helped and they as well now would like to kind of give back. And this is where we have been working quite extensively with the Fulbright Alumni Association from US, where kind of uh, together with them, we are tailoring, uh, tailoring experience and related trips for their members, where they come to our communities and then there is this sharing and helping uh, which is given to local owners in which, in a way, they are giving back to, to different communities, but as well uh, learning and receiving back from them. And uh, this is a, I mean, it's a, the, the Fulbright Alumni Association is an extremely inspiring uh, partner in this, in this particular cooperation because they have, uh, it's, it's, it's the motto of their work for, of their work that we as well learn a lot. Then uh, one of the final ones that I wanted to present is that what we are kind of taking baby steps in, of course, is the heritage uh, tech, we call it, but it's actually uh, using technology as much as possible to both uh, assess and both document and survey, but also share. And uh, this is an interesting example of one of the towers that have been, uh, that have been, um, that have been destroyed in the earthquake or kind of damaged in the earthquake in 2009 in Korea. And what's interesting about this uh, project is that by using technology, which is kind of purposeful for the architect to develop plans, we as well are having a certain aspects of uh, uh, documentation that then can be commun well, easily communicated to be to community members or young professionals or architects or architectural students in which we can engage in uh, different levels and different levels of meanings uh, when it comes to our common discussions. So um, 
our ways forward and to conclude, I, uh, we are hoping to continue to be relevant, meaning to answer to the needs of the communities as well as uh, our partnering organizations and authorities. And we also would like to continue to stay on the ground, to be on the ground and be hands on. As well, uh, I think that what we are suffering and what we would like to see more in, is of the, we would like to see more of the systematic change because we believe that, you know, all these good models which are created not only by us, but by many of our partners are very rarely kind of taken into uh, account and have actually been endorsed. We kind of see bad practices repeat uh, continuously. And as well, we would like to continue to be professional and effect, uh, or, I mean, facts based, but also that's how we would like to continue communicating. And as well, staying professional, but also conversational, meaning that you know we don't keep our kind of blindfolds, but we engage and we continue to provide the opportunities of engagement. Is something that we will definitely continue to work with. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Leila, for this incredible presentation of your work. I have to say, I admire everybody who uh, tries to bridge a huge gap between tangible and intangible heritage in the Balkans, but also everywhere, because we have this idea of a tangible heritage is something which is really managed by the state and large organizations, and something that is really, you know, difficult to get uh, people, you know, Grab the grassroots involved in. There are so many resistances there. And also, uh, we also see intangible heritage as something really soft and cuddly that, you know, belongs to the people and the state is not really interested in because there are no stakes there uh, in terms of, you know, property values or, uh, you know, market values. Yeah.